Hello and welcome to Lockdown Women's Basketball. T. Baker is here to talk about the Big East Conference. Lockdown Women's Basketball starts now. <laughs> You are Locked On Women's Basketball, your daily podcast on women's basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Well, hi there and happy Thursday, everybody. Welcome to Locked On Women's Basketball. Thank you for making us your first listen every day. We've been so encouraged by the numbers just going up, up, up. Uh, for all of you listening, so thank you. For those of you who are encountering us for the first time, you can subscribe anywhere you get your podcast. You can go to YouTube and hit that subscribe button. It is free. And of course, it's not just me. It's not just T. It is everyone at thenexthoops.com who's doing incredible work across the country covering this world of women's basketball. Uh, make sure you check it out. Over 100 reported pieces every single month. TheNextHoops.com. You can subscribe to us for $9 a month, $72 a year. There's no better way for you to spend your money on women's basketball coverage, growing what we all know needs to happen. And um, T, you cover some things that are especially close to my heart. You have been the point person on our WBL coverage, uh, a league that badly needs more attention, and I'm delighted that we're doing that. You are also uh, running point on the Big East, uh, which is, of course, on my hat and uh, always, however, in my heart. So, T, welcome, and thank you for coming to join us uh, to talk about the Big East Conference. When you think about the hierarchy of women's basketball conferences, just kind of going into this, and we'll get into the depths of it. You wrote this really, really good Big East preview piece that gets people a sense of what matters most in the conference. But where do you see it at this point? Because people have this power five uh, that they always talk about. And uh, you know, it's driven by football in a lot of ways, but I just feel like it understates kind of where the Big East is. Yeah, thanks for the question, Howard, and thanks for having me. So proud of what we're building here at the Next and in, in, uh, with Locked On Women's Basketball. I'm always happy to talk about uh, the Big East. I um, grew up in the East Coast and, and grew up watching the old Big East. Um, so it's it's such an honor to be able to uh, cover the teams that I, I used to love watching and, and just get to those games. Um, so, you know, I think that there's always this is the Big East, the Power Six um, conference discussion. And I think in particular with women's basketball, um, I mean, you you have to look at the dominance of the conference over time. I think uh, when we go back to the old days of the Big East, right, you had Connecticut women's basketball, who, of course, is, is a dynasty. Uh, but you also had Notre Dame. Um, you also had Louisville. You had these, these powerhouses. And I think all of these... Um, discussions with with conference realignment has created a very different flavor to the Big East these days, um, you know, but you have some strong presences, um, you know, of course, the Connecticut Huskies who are simply dominant always, um, but then you have DePaul and you have Seton Hall and you have Villanova and you have these teams that are sort of on the, the margins of the NCAA tournament every year. Some of them, you know, cracked that barrier last year, but I, I just think back of uh, last year's Big East tournament here in Seton Hall head coach Tony Bazello just really making the the case for the Big East conference that they are an NCAA conference team they should have more respect from the, um, the committees and um, I think they're right there I think they are in that power six category and um, that make, make me sound like a bit of a homer in that you know I, I cover it but I really do think it's there and I think that um, it's led by by Connecticut but Connecticut is also helping the other teams in the conference face that high level of competition that gets them ready for the tournament that twice a year, they're playing the best team in the country. One of them, you know, the, the data I think is clear. I think you can go beyond even just, and, and look, I, I'm predisposed toward the Big East in that way, you know, as, as a Jersey kid who grew up essentially in the geographical center of that conference as well and seeing it, but to your point and, and, and that last point is particularly important because it's, uh, exactly what Val Ackerman said would happen, that you bring UConn back into the fold uh, after an interregnum 
I guess would be the best way to put it, where they were in the AAC and all was not right with the world. And I complained about this on Twitter for years. And unlike almost everything that people complain about on Twitter, in this case, something happened uh, after that uh, and the Big East returned. UConn to the fold, and I'm delighted to see it. But it has. It has elevated the conference. And you and I were both at Big East Media Day, and I really liked there was this question that somebody asked Gina Oriema about, you know, did you vote? You can't vote for your own team when you're the coach uh, preseason uh, to, to be number one. And he voted Villanova. Villanova was the only one with the first place vote other than UConn preseason. And somebody asked Gino, did you vote for Villanova to give him confidence? And Gino's response was, um, I, I guess I'm paraphrasing, was like, they, they beat our asses last year. We don't need to give them any more confidence. And so we're seeing it, right? Like you said, you know, Creighton made that incredible run to the Elite Eight. Villanova, not UConn, has the player of the year preseason in Maddie Segrist. And so there is just this depth, this, uh, you know, Seton Hall didn't even make the tournament last year. So what do they do? They go out and have a huge run in the WNIT. And so there is, it is not just UConn at the top. It is a conference that has more depth than ever before. Do you think, you know, there were, there were four, four tournament teams last year. Do you think they match? Do you think they exceed that? Um, you know, let's, let's kind of, Think about kind of that from a macro perspective before we get into some of the specifics. You know, I do think they match and I actually think they surpassed the the tournament teams last year. I'm going to go and and make the prediction that, you know, we have UConn um, and DePaul that will be in the tournament. They are regulars in the NCAA tournament. Uh, Last year, Vanilla uh, Villanova upset BYU in the first round, made an impressive run. And of course, Creighton. Um, who plays just a really beautiful style of team basketball with a motion offense. It's just really beautiful to watch um, reach the sweet 16 last year. Um, and so I think that those teams will follow up on that success of last year. You know, Anissa Morrow at DePaul is just one of the best players in the country. Uh, Seton Hall's um, Nancy Lieberman award nominee mm-hmm. um, we have at Seton Hall is, is Lauren Parker lane. And they just have that star power to, to carry their teams. And last year, Seton Hall made it all the way to the uh, WNIT final. And we know history tells us that those teams that make those finals, that make runs in WNIT, are just knocking on the door of that tournament. So I, I think it's going to be... That's yeah, right. <laughs> right. Exactly. It's going to be those those five teams that I'm going to keep my eye on for the bubble and to make it into the NCAA tournament. I do. I just want to check you on one small thing, which is that Creighton, um, if, if I remember right, and I just double-checked it, they they went they went to the elite eight last year. They even beat Iowa State in the Sweet Sixteen. It was only uh, South Carolina who ultimately stopped that run. And uh, I mean, frankly, no one was going to beat South Carolina last year, as as we saw. Um, but they were right there. And there's something really cool about Creighton's schedule. There is uh, just they are playing it tough. They are at South Dakota. Uh, that happens Thursday night. Then they've got Nebraska next Tuesday. That one is at home. And then they go to Northern Iowa. So Jim Flannery has come back from this with a challenge in the non-conference that can only help him from a seeding perspective. I know they were second overall in the preseason coaches poll, uh, but uh, Lauren Jensen, who, you know, famously beat, her former team at Iowa um, is actually a big talk. I was up in Minnesota uh, this past uh, this past few days, and she's a Minnesota native, and there's a lot of conversation about she's kind of the one who got away from U of M as well. Uh, do you think Creighton has what it takes to potentially challenge UConn, especially a Paige Beckers list UConn this year? You know, I think – it's it's a good question. I think we're yet to see, you know, how all the pieces for UConn um, play out on the court. I think um, what Creighton has going for them is that they have so many returning players from last year. Um, they have a chemistry that is palpable when you watch them play, right? And the opportunity to see them play a few times in person last year and the way that they communicate on the floor, the way that they want this. You know, I had the opportunity to speak to uh, Lauren Jensen at Media Day and, and some others um, from the Creighton team and you know, 
they have in their minds achieving what they achieved last year, right? They want to make it to the elite eight. They want to, they want to continue to put themselves on that national map. And like you said, they're, they're testing themselves later in December. They're, they're uh, playing against Arkansas and also Stanford. And then they have the opportunity to play Connecticut twice. And so one of those times I could see it happening, right? I think the big East is deeper than ever. And in that team basketball, they play can, can really present a challenge for a team like Connecticut, which is figuring themselves out, you know, has a lot of new players in the rotation. No question about it. And and so there's – it's worth point, pointing out, Lauren Jensen, by the way, in their opener, the win over South Dakota State, she scored 30. So she is here not just to follow up what she did, but to build on it. So we'll, we, we've got a lot more to get into, but I, I want to talk to you first, if I can, about LinkedIn. Uh, these days, every new potential hire can feel like a, new, a high stage wager for your small business. It's something that I can tell you we work on at the next where it doesn't just matter that you're able to cover women's basketball, but our culture matters a great deal to us, making sure that everyone is supportive of one another. And it's something that I take very seriously when I think through who comes in and joins our group. And LinkedIn Jobs helps with that, too. They help find you the right people for your team faster and for free. So you just add your job in the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the job, the, spread the word that you're hiring. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NBA. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NBA to post your jobs for free terms and conditions apply. And so when we think about who is coming in for the job of guarding Maddie Seagrist in this league, I, 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 I checked LinkedIn. I checked everywhere. I got zero results. Is that your uh, read of the situation as well? There's simply not a way to do it? It is, Howard. I mean, she is just such a dynamic player. And, and again, having the opportunity to see her play in person a few times last year, you know, the, the way that she not only can get to the basket, can create her own shot, but can can create shots for others around her. She's a, a tough rebounder. Um, you know, last season she was averaging nearly a double-double with 25.3 points a game, 9.2 <laughs> rebounds. Um, okay. Isn't that insane to you, just to be able to put those types of numbers up? It wasn't like Villanova was scoring 100 points a game. Right. And and she is just a, a centerpiece to what they do. Um, she's the preseason player of the year after being um, the Big East player of the year last season. And, um, you know, I think she's only gotten better in the offseason. I talked to her at Big East Media Day about uh, her experience playing three on three basketball this summer. And she mm -hmm. just talked about the ways that it, it elevated her game even further, you know, the, the tighter shot clock, the 12 seconds and, and being able to create an offensive scheme in that time. Um, she says she looks at the full shot clock now in five on five basketball and thinks she has plenty of time to execute. So that's scary for opponents um, that she's improved. Her game is more versatile and, and even says she's improved her defensive uh, efforts. So I, I'm excited to see her on the court. And I, I don't really know anyone who can stop her. My, my favorite stat, for her is her turnover percentage is below 8%, you know, which is Elena Deladon territory, you know, who's obviously been the best to ever do it at the WNBA level, but just the, the skill level is remarkable. And I was delighted to see her able to get back to Poughkeepsie, New York uh, earlier this week, scored 21 out there. Uh, Villanova beat Marist, uh, and, which is a nice win. It was a nice road win. Marist is a solid Mac team. Uh, but also just to be able to go back to um, Lord's High School area where she played uh, was something I thought was a really nice moment. And and she is preseason player of the year. She's certainly in that conversation. Uh, there are plenty of folks who are keeping an eye on her for next year's WNBA draft. Uh, but it was interesting to me that Anissa Morrow was not, I, I, I think to me when I think about sort of what the two of them did last year, they're right there. Anissa, of course, is going into her sophomore season. And, uh, you know, again, similar video game type numbers as a freshman, uh, to my to my mind, was clearly freshman of the year nationally, not just in the Big East. Um, just take me through what Anissa's next steps are and, uh, you know, what you're looking for most out of her over at DePaul. 
I think Anissa Moro can be a dominant post nationally and she is already right last season you, like you said those video game numbers 21.9 points a game 13.9 uh, rebounds averaged a double double um she had 27 consecutive double doubles last season second only to Aliyah Boston who we know is just playing at another level right so she's she's behind just Aliyah Boston of South Carolina and um you know Talking to her this season at Media Day, um, I asked her about, you know, is she feeling the pressure after having such a remarkable uh, freshman season? And mm -hmm. she says she's using that pressure to motivate her, right? She she feels that she can show out as one of the best players in the country. Um, you know, last season, she said she wasn't surprised by the accolades she received because she's been working hard for this and, and she knows what she can do on the floor. So a confident Anissa Morrow putting up those numbers, leading her team, um, I think she can propel DePaul to be one of the top two teams in the in the Big East and in a national contender. Doug Bruno knows what he's doing, that's for sure. So you know, you know, if anyone's going to be able to maximize who she is, I, I talked to Doug a little bit that day, uh, and he mentioned uh, efficiency as sort of being that next level for her as well. Um, but it is him. By the way, I do want to just circle back real briefly on Creighton. Uh, that non-conference I highlighted the first week. But listen to this. Listen to what Creighton does between December 10th and the end of 2022. You got Drake on December 10th, Arkansas December 17th, at Stanford on December 20th, then back home for a couple of Big East uh, conference slate. You got Connecticut the 28th and DePaul on New Year's Eve at 3 p.m. Uh, so, wow, Creighton DePaul, New Year's Eve. I, I, I certainly know what we're going to be doing that afternoon in this family. We're going to be watching that. That's for sure. That's, yeah, and uh, I think it speaks to the way that um, head coach Jim, Jim Flannery at, uh, at uh, Creighton has positioned his team to be a national contender, right? He knows what it takes to get to the elite eight now um, and putting those teams on the schedule, having that, that preparation, putting together that NCAA tournament resume, I think is where they're at. And he wants to show that they deserve to be there. In terms of Seton Hall as well, because I, I, I want us not to forget Seton Hall, uh, A, because Seton Hall deserves our attention and B, because we'll probably hear from Tony Bazella if we don't mention Seton Hall. So, for multiple reasons, very important to do so. But, you know, you mentioned Lauren Park Lane, and I think it's worth noting when it comes to what she has done as a player that she's turned herself into this hyper-efficient three-point shooter as well. Uh, she shot 39% from three last year. She is listed at five foot three, um, which might be generous, but she has pro dreams and an increasing skill set that you look and say, you know, geez, why not? You know, I'm just, take me through kind of what you've seen. I know you had the chance to profile her last year. It was a very, a very good piece uh, for the next as well. Uh, what are you looking for at Lauren Park Lane this season? I'm looking for more of the same. You know, she is, like you said, 5'3", might be generous. She's a, a very small player on the court, but she brings such a punch to her game that, um, is infectious. Honestly, I saw her play um, here in Providence against Providence last season. It was one of uh, three consecutive games where she put up a 30 piece and and she just can shoot lights out. She is an energizer bunny like she she knows how to get her teammates going. And she puts in the work, you know, of all the players I speak to, she talks about how she's at the gym. Uh, her and Sydney Cooks, teammate Sydney Cooks, um, talked about this is their final season with Seton Hall. They're going all out. They stayed at uh, campus over the summer and worked out. Um, and they're ready to elevate this team. Again, they, they made it to the finals of the WNIT last season. They are um, a team that, you know, advanced to the semifinals of the Big East tournament last year as a surprise to some uh, defeating Creighton. So um, they are really a team that is is on the rise and should be looked out for. And, and Coach Tony Bazzella knows how to get a team going. And um, I think with, with Lauren at the point and the support she has around her, they can make a deep run this year and, and really, again, be one of the top tier teams in the Big East. Life is short and we need to find joy where we can. And so I am just urging all of my listeners to make a night of it, go to Town Hall Deli, which is the origination of the New Jersey Sloppy Joe, one of the best sandwiches you're ever going to eat. Go eat those sandwiches, turn around, go over to Walsh Gymnasium, a historic gym 
uh, a place that has so many memories and is a cauldron of sound. And go watch Lauren Park Lane and Seton Hall play. I, I, I can't, if you can't get joy out of that in your day, then, um, you, you know, I, you're never going to find it because it is as enjoyable as there is. And I can't wait. I've got, I've got some on my calendar ahead of me too. And really looking forward to it, especially because Seton Hall, among other things, has joined the Ivy League unofficially. They're playing Columbia. They're playing Princeton. They're, that, uh, Tony told us that Harvard's next uh, year on the schedule as well. So Seton Hall, Ivy League. Uh, very much excited about that, but in the contention for the Big East as well. Well, T, thank you so much for joining us. We're delighted to have you here. And to our listeners, we're also grateful that you made Locked On Women's Basketball your first listen every single day. Now that you've done that, make sure you check out Locked On Sports Today. Locked On Sports Today is your 30-minute guide to everything that's going on across the Locked On Host Network, instant reactions, big game recaps, and even your take of the day. It's available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and whenever you, wherever you get podcasts. Make sure you are following T at MXT Baker for Big East, WBL, so much more. Um, I'm delighted you're here and delighted you're part of our team. And, uh, you know, thank you for being part of everything that we're doing as well. Thank you, Howard. Uh, happy to be here today and to share. And um, the crossover point for me in the WBL and the Big East coverage is that uh, DePaul head coach Doug Bruno used to coach for the Chicago Hustle in the WBL. So love that crossover. Yes. Um, and there's continuity in what we do here and in all of our coverage from past, present, and future. So thanks for the platform you've created for us and appreciate being here. Really delighted. And and thank you all for listening. Uh, make sure you tune in tomorrow. We got a really, really special one coming. Uh, Natalie Heverin went down to Norfolk, Virginia, and sat with Nancy Lieberman talking about all things past, present, and future women's basketball. Really excited to bring that one to you. So until tomorrow, I hope you all have a wonderful Women's Basketball Thursday. I'm Howard Magdal, wishing you a terrific day. Are Locked On Women's Basketball, your daily podcast on women's basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. <laughs>